Welcome to Bound by Books. I am one of your hosts and contemporary and suspense romance writer, Danielle Bannister. I also write under Danny Bannister. And today I am joined by the beautiful <laughs> Tina Moss. Tell us, what do you write, Tina? Oh, wow. I got a beautiful comment that's today. Right. Thank you. Since I've been feeling like crap lately, that's so <laughs> nice to hear. <laughs> but I am a sci-fi and paranormal romance author, mostly focusing on the sci-fi side right now, but may have a paranormal romance project in the works and as a surprise. So you'll have to continue <laughs> all listening to the podcast to find out. <laughs> well, today we, we were going to talk about sort of the best and sort of worst parts for us as being our writer mm -hmm. and I think sometimes as writers we can be a, a little down on ourselves or like constantly like oh why are we doing this there are constant struggles so this is kind of like something I think we both needed to kind of like remind us of like oh yeah there are some <laughs> good parts. parts to this as well so you know as we're looking at sort of the end of the year and like looking at our writing years ahead I thought it maybe is a good time of year to sort of lift up <laughs> both sides of the writing coin love it <laughs> i will try not to be my normal jaded self i will i will be optimistic and upbeat we can be honest <laughs> we can be honest we can we can share the truth of it it's it's not all sitting in the in the sun with a cup of coffee with a you know typewriter as the the, the fall leaves blow outside. It's not all, you know, transcendent. Being I do there. think that's very important. I have to say, I, I saw a tweet today, ironically, as we were preparing to talk about this subject. And it was from an author who said she had a recent book signing and only two people showed up and she was very disappointed. And as it turns out, the tweet ended up going um, viral on Twitter and just like so many other people saying, thank you for this. Thank you for showing the side that's not all rainbows and roses. Thank you for showing the reality. Thank you for, you know, giving giving this so that other people who experience it aren't aren't feeling so bad. So I think I think it is important to share both sides of things for sure. Absolutely. I, I, and I've been where where she is before. I've been to signings where there were over at least 40 different authors there and mm -hmm. no one no readers yeah no one <laughs> not even painful. like friends and family nobody <laughs> yeah so yep. yeah we there are times that and i have a signing coming up this weekend there is the first season uh, first time for this particular event could very well be that nobody shows up you know you just kind of have to be prepared for that and yeah. you know Eat, eat the candy that you've brought to give away and, you know, console <laughs> yourself on that. But definitely, <laughs> if, especially if you're going to a signing where that happens and there's other authors there, it's a great time to network and get Absolutely. to know other authors. So. Absolutely. Peruse the tables. See, yeah. you know, what do their tables look like? What could you pick up and go, oh, I really like what they've done there. Or, you know, oh, I like the way that, you know, banner really pops or even the opposite. Oh, maybe that that display is a little too much for me you know you can yeah. you can learn but you can also you know trade paperbacks with the other authors and That's like, what hey, I was you know about. We'll, yeah trade your paperbacks and then you know you're getting a free read they're getting a free read and maybe it's a connection down the line that that yeah. you could use for for some other project you, know, you can also do them as giveaways like you can sign yeah, them absolutely. for each other and, and absolutely giveaways. there's there's definitely even in like, you know, those those darkest kind of moments where you're like, oh, my gosh, nobody's here. You can you can make it a good thing by yeah. connecting with other authors. So, yeah, and it's all about the attitude, too. You've got to, yeah. you know, make sure that, you know what, the readers aren't coming. What am I going to still pull from this experience? How can I still make this worth? while make it feel like a success instead of a failure so sometimes <laughs> it's mindset right very true very true so wait you have if you're um watching us on youtube you can see that danielle oh, has yes. a book in the bag and it looks so pretty so well yeah i used to have a little second. display here but it's all broken down because it's going to the side so, so wait to... but this is your most recent book this right? is my most recent waiting tell, in the wing you have to tell us about that before we you continue that, onward this one <laughs> This one, it was a fun one. It's speaking about, you know, uh, collaborations and you, know, you never know where a collaboration is going to come. This is a book about theater, hence the, the red curtain here, um, about actors rehearsing a play and I needed a play for them to rehearse. And instead of using something, you know, that I'd have to get rights for or something mm -hmm. from the public domain, I asked a writer, uh, playwright friend 
to write me a script. And oh, the crazy God. fool did. And so he now has a proper length <laughs> play that he didn't have before. And I have excerpts that I can use in the actual book. And so, so cool. it's combining two different passions, two different collaborations. Fun way to 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 generate something like that. So it's a you know a fish out of water story, a romance, you know. It's it's got my love of theater. I had my degree in theater, so there's love you know it. I'm able to pull some of that theater background um, in as well. Um, so when you told me about this, I thought it was such a cool project. And like, really, if we're highlighting some of the pros of being a writer, that is definitely a pro. Getting the chance Absolutely. to collaborate and do Absolutely. like out of the box things and just be in the creative arts and in different forms. It's it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really fun too. If you, if you're collaborating yeah. with the right people, it's right. really fun <laughs> because writing can be pretty lonely and you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're just up against, you know, yourself and you're not sure if something's working or not. But when you're collaborating with somebody, you can exchange, you know, chapters with them. I was reading his play, giving him feedback. He was reading my book, giving me feedback. So it was a really a back and forth. I'm like, oh, you did this in your book. What if I did this in the play? And, you know, some like meta things that only he and I would probably ever pick up on that we, you know, so made those fun. references to it. But it made it fun and it made yeah. it interesting to write. Like, how can we surprise the other person? And so it, it was a fun that. way to, to approach a project. So I highly recommend doing something like that. Um, if you get a chance to do that, it, it's, it's super fun. I got invited to do um a share, well, not a shared world per se, mm-hmm. but like a shared theme. And I've done this in anthologies before and I've always had a good experience. I've been lucky with that, but yeah. I got invited to do like a Christmas project Ooh. by other sci-fi um, romance authors. I think a Christmas actually- sci-fi. Yeah, I think we're actually going to do it as like some different holidays. So I think everybody's going to do like a different holiday. So originally it started as a Christmas thing. And then it's like, oh, maybe we'll each, so we can have them coming out during the year. We'll each do a different holiday. But I thought, oh man, this is what a like a fun project. So we'll have similar covers and able to promote each other. But I was like, that's very fun. as As soon as they said it, I'm like, yeah. Yes, let's yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, that's the kind of stuff that's fun about yeah. writing is that that sort of collaboration and getting your brain going and firing up the creativity. Yeah, and that connecting with people that you enjoy working with and whose writing that you you probably enjoy as well. Like I'm a fan Absolutely. of a lot of these authors, and uh, the chance to get to you know do something collaboratively with yeah. them is just super fun. Yeah, and I, I've done a shared world before. It was the, the very first time I'd ever done a shared world writing in a genre I'd never written in before. <laughs> I, I maybe don't recommend that. Mm, <laughs> maybe that's stick tough. with the genre that you know how to write. Because <laughs> I did feel a little like, I have no idea what I am doing sort of vibe. <laughs> you know, it was very stressful. Like, I don't think I'm doing this right. <laughs> I, so I got it done. Made all the deadlines. <laughs> And I think I came up with a decent book, but it was very much, it was a very big learning curve for me to do something like that. So that was a lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, that's that's not a bad thing either, because then you also learn like what works in a different genre and what doesn't. And if you're even interested in pursuing that yeah. genre. Yeah. So yeah. it's definitely all, all learning experiences, um, even if they're not like coming out to the fruition the way you want them to can right. still have benefits. So. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk a, a little bit about, um, mm-hmm. sort of the best, worst parts of, of being a writer with you, um, is I think that there's like this, this myth or this stereotype that there is this level of education that comes with writing, that you have to have a certain level of education um, <laughs> and that it's not really open for people who maybe don't have you know, Mm -hmm. uh, secondary education. Now, I know that you definitely do have some secondary education going on, and I Uh I do as well. But I I, I guess I wanted to talk to you about what your thoughts were on that. I love this question because so in my life, I have had uh, a series of different careers all around academia, though. So I've had academia and publishing. So uh, I've been an English professor. I've been a English teacher. I've been a professional and an expert for students with learning disabilities and mental health disorders. Um, and so all of them have been around 
you know, the, the process of learning. Right. right. So I have right. really big opinions when it you comes have. to this. <laughs> <laughs> so there absolutely 100%. There is nothing that says that you cannot be an author if you do not have um, an advanced degree, if you don't even have a degree. Like I love education in terms of learning. So any way that you can learn more is always valuable, but that does not necessarily mean that you need a bachelor's degree or a master's right. degree or right. whatever in order to get that education. Right. Um, there are oodles of craft books that you could get from a library if you so don't many. want to buy them. So many that you can read and learn more. There's probably lots of online stuff you can take that's for free or pretty sure. cheap on just learning craft. Um, but even just reading books. Mm hmm especially in your genre, is going to teach you a lot about the genre, how to write, how not to write, if you're reading a book that's maybe not so good. Um, so, yeah, there's there's absolutely value in education. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. going to say that our degrees are, are useless or worthless. No. But it's not, it's not, I don't feel like it's a, a, a an end to, you know, oh, well, I haven't been to school for writing. I wrote my first book and I had never gone to school for anything besides theater like what did I know I didn't know nothing about writing yeah you know it wasn't until I started writing I'm like oh I should maybe take a few classes or learn a little bit more because I wanted to make sure I was doing it right and I, yep. I, I felt like there were tools that I was missing so I you know took it to the next step because I realized that there were areas that I was lacking in and maybe I should should learn more but I didn't start that way I started out not knowing a thing about writing a hundred percent. And I will say that I've had many wonderful mentors, teachers over the years that have definitely helped me to develop my writing. Um, but I don't think you necessarily need to have a college experience or a right. graduate school experience to get those things because you can there's I mean, Gotham Writers Workshop in New York City is one of the, you know, top uh, programs for learning about writing and it, and it's not a college program it's it's an independent program um so and many many free resources online many courses that you can take yep. the only thing i will say that i do feel was extremely beneficial in my graduate degree and i have a master's in english so i'm not an mfa so it was combined between um writing and reading is learning how to take criticism because <laughs> oh my gosh yeah. if you yeah. have certain and I don't know if all MA programs are like this but certainly mine was if you ever wanted to have your writing and your soul ripped apart <laughs> a graduate program is the way to do it I just had a conversation with an author today and she was you know saying how she's trying to develop this thicker skin and she feels like she is now that she has two books out and is going for her third book um, but in the beginning, it was so hard. And I was like, girl, a lot of, lot of imposter syndrome in those <laughs> early books. You there is no review on this planet people. that's going to ever come to the level of criticism that I received in graduate school. So my skin is as thick as it can get. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I mean, there, there's something to be said about the criticism. Like, hey, at least it resonated and it resonated very angrily to you. But at least you're going to remember my book. Even yeah, there was an it. emotional response. You know what? But the best, re the, the hardest reviews are not the good reviews or bad reviews. It's the reviews that have nothing. It's the reviews right, that right, are like, got right. this. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 I once, I once had a review on one of my suspense books that it was too suspenseful. I love that. I love it. I can't tell yes, you how many I've gotten you. recently. So recently I put out um, a novella. And so, I love this because it's very clear in the blurb, in the book, everywhere that it's a novella. And I've gotten, this book is too short. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not sure a lot of people necessarily know what novella means. Maybe not. I, I, think, I think maybe the book, you know, readers, the avid readers, but I don't know if the general public understands that novella mm -hmm. You might be right. short. <laughs> I'm going to have to do a poll amongst like non-reader friends of do you know what I'm not sure that I knew what a novella was before I started writing. And that's a fair point. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So um, that might actually be one of the positive slash negatives of being a writer is that you kind of get immersed in book world and you kind of forget that like 
maybe the average person doesn't know the thing that you're talking about. Right. Which is lovely because right. then you get to have this whole little world to yourself. Right. But then on the flip side, it's like, oh, wait. Right. <laughs> These other people right. don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. And and sort of to that point, that sort of the good that mixes with the bad is like if somebody like devours your book, like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, when's the next one coming out? My dude, <laughs> you're like, ooh. It's a time to get this one out. What do you mean, when's the next one coming out? I'm glad you loved it. That makes me feel good. But yeah. I don't have a next one for you yet. I'm still fighting it. So it's. I think it's that's a negative. negative. I'm going to say yeah. that's a negative. And the pressure up, yeah. of like yeah. being able to constantly put out, especially in, in the climate that we're currently in, where it's so much of like, go, go, go. And instant entertainment and yeah yeah, binge and like you know netflix puts out their entire series instead of having to wait week by week to see the next thing so yeah people expect things fast and as a writer outputting you know very quickly can be can be challenging so yeah yeah no absolutely and you know if you're writing a series and you don't have the full one out right Uh, readers often won't even pick up book one is hard until they know everything is done and you can't really financially maybe support yourself writing series one through five six seven yeah and it, hope yep. that it's gonna work you know so it, it puts a writer in a very precarious situation for sure <laughs> yeah and i've said that to some of um our authors so for those who are longtime podcast listeners you'll know that i own city Al press um but i've said that to them before like sometimes with series that readers will wait until an entire series comes out so if you're you know four books in and it's a five book series like don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean that your books are dead it might mean that people are now waiting and usually when we have a series complete we just do a whole new marketing campaign as if it was brand new books because we're like completed series and we can we can advertise that so that is definitely one of the struggles though of being a writer is the the demand for output yeah i i absolutely agree so to to sort of maybe a shift from from something that (laughs) (laughs) positive 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 what was do you do you remember a moment when you were first writing and you went oh yeah this is what I want to do was there a moment like a sort of a light bulb moment for you I'm (laughs) so cliche um (laughs) yeah when I was about five (laughs) oh wow really yeah I'm one of those people who's like have always known that I wanted to be a writer um when I was a little kid I just found I my grandmother, I've told this story before. My grandmother was a librarian for 27 years. I lived in the library. She would bring me books all the time. Like the value you of lived reading. the life. Yeah, that like, I did. That's the dream, I right? did. And it was, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn. So the city was all around me. This is like very creative, artsy type of world. Um, and reading was very, very big in my, in my household, um, especially with my grandmother. So I learn the value of writing and and books very early on and I immediately like wanted to 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 do this major thing like this amazing magical thing putting stories into the world um so I started like as soon as I think I picked up a crayon (laughs) wow wow that's impressive that's impressive (laughs) I I came into it a Dead later in life after but you my still have theater background born. you I still did. have like a lot of artsy background I so. did I did I, yeah I was never gonna be on the page I was gonna be on the stage baby nice. <laughs> I was gonna make my fortune there and then I realized I really don't like people <laughs> I don't like living in big cities I don't I don't like the environment in which theater Broadway lives. Lives. It, it, it lives where there are lots of people and I to be realize... fair nobody really likes uh Times Square unless you're a tourist you don't really like Times Square so <laughs> well, there you go um so I I turned to the page like after like kids were born and I was like mm-hmm. you know nursing and diapering and couldn't do even community theater because I was just you know this vessel for small children so I had no yeah. creative outlet at all mm-hmm. and so writing sort of became the theater for me you know that creative theater for me and I'm like oh I can right. be introverted and create all of these wild experiences a score I like that awesome so, yeah. was there a particular book or author or series that really inspired you to well, now I'm gonna be the one that's cliched 
Twilight, of course. But you know what it was? It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't necessarily the books that did it. Uh -huh. I looked at the back cover and I opened it and saw that the author had kids, small kids. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, she can do this and have kids? Oh, interesting. And that's, that's really what it cool. was. It was. It was that that I could be somebody other than mom. Oh, I'm, that's you know? gonna resonate. That has to resonate with so many people. Like, yeah, yeah. that's pretty awesome. I yeah. love that. And look, Twilight like, too. <laughs> Twilight gets a lot of flack, but you know what? That I think it inspired a lot of writers. You can't. There is no denying, no denying yeah. that it revitalized the paranormal romance genre. It yeah. it sprung it on its head in a YA ish way. It really opened up conversations about what we could write about and what we could do on the page and what could be presented to a young adult audience. So. For everybody that hates on Twilight, you cannot deny its cultural impact. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? I have no shame. I have all the books. I have that. I went I told, I, the movies. I, I got them. I got them. In there. 100%. No shame. <laughs> I, you know, they helped turn me into the person I am today. So, so no shame. I understand all the criticism. I get it. Yeah. But the, you know what? I think that's also a really good point about being a writer is not everything that is written and not everything that an author goes to write even in their own career has to be the best thing that has ever been put on the page. Not everybody's going for the Nobel Prize in literature. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. I write, yeah. I proudly write Alien Smut. And I say this with my whole chest. I love it. <laughs> I, it's it's super fun. It is never going to be the next great American novel. And that's right. perfectly okay because right. my readers enjoy it and I enjoy writing it. And right. I think- right giving yourself like some some leeway and some grace to say like yes you want to put forth your best work but that doesn't mean it has to be uh you know not everything is literary fiction that's why we have it's genre not, fiction. it's not gonna yeah it's not gonna appeal to a wide audience maybe no, but it might doesn't very well hit the button of one specific market and that's really Absolutely. all you need yeah that's really all you need so and then, then, and that's again, is sort of a, a writing thing that you have to learn is being mm -hmm. okay. I think for a long time, I was like, I was trying to find where, where, trying to ap appeal to that sort of wide net. You know, I'll toss out this genre. I'll toss out this genre. You know, I want to please everybody. It's the Libra <laughs> in me. I want to please everyone. <laughs> everybody, you get a book and you get a story. <laughs> you know. But, you know, until you settle, sort of settle and go, you know what? This is what I like writing the most and going, mm -hmm. all right. Here's my lane. Now I go forward in in what I feel. This is my alien smut, whatever whatever exactly. it might be. Um, it's exactly. not alien smut because that's like the sci fi stuff. I can't do that. I I realized I'm. Everybody not, must find their own version of alien. I'm smut. not good with the whole like world building thing. Mm -hmm. Like I I can't I have a hard time with Oof. that. I I I, I oh. <laughs> I'm more I, interested in what yeah. the characters are doing and, and doing with each other. Yeah, I don't know why I had it in my head that, you know, this would I, I for some reason, when I first started out in sci fi romance, I just had this idea that it was going to be similar to paranormal romance and that mm -hmm. like I had the world established because it was set in in our world, essentially. But I just right. had to have the laws of like the paranormal creatures and how things, you know, would behave in that. And for some reason, my head thought, oh, sci fi will be similar. No, <laughs> Tina, you have the entire universe, literally that you have to figure out like planets and people on different planets and how different species interact with different things. Gravity, air, prepared. spaceships, yep, everything, oh, technology, all... pages oh, and pages of, of oh. technology. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what I was thinking, yeah. but I love it. So and I guess see, it's okay. and <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, well, that kind of, I guess, hints to sort of the next thing. What mm. for, for you, what would you think is like, the hardest part about being a writer is it the research mm -hmm. is it the marketing is it the plotting is it the actual writing for you like what what is There's your <laughs> so many facets of being a writer from the actual words on the page and the craft of it 
to the business side of marketing and branding and blah, 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 blah. There's just so it's such a multifaceted career in many ways because you essentially are a business on top of an employee in that business and also the boss in that business. And it doesn't matter if you're traditionally published because you still have to have a similar sense of marketing and branding, et cetera. I think the hardest part for me um, is just, I think, what most people feel in their life, and that's time. Having the time to do all the things that you need to do to be a successful author in this business. I think time and not time management. It's not time management, it's just actual time, like having more hours in the day. Because as much as I love writing, I run a business. I want to make sure that my physical health is good. I want to take care of my friends and family. You know, we're all well-rounded people. And because writing is such like a passionate thing, it's very hard to give time to that passion, even though, even if it's your career, because in the back of my head, personally, I'm always still thinking, well, you know, this is the thing that I love and I have to do all the things I have to do before I do the thing that I love, because that's just kind of the way that I'm wired. And I'm not saying that's a good way, but it's definitely one of the hardest parts of it. Yeah. It's hard to put your, your needs and desires before other things for sure. Right. And like I said, even if it's a job and it's paying the bills, it's still such ingrained into who we are and and into our passion that it's really hard to to put that as the thing that you need to do. What do you think for you? What do you think is the hardest thing? Yeah. Yeah. Time management is is a very strong one. Um, I I would also maybe maybe as a as a as a tied position is sort of always feeling like I'm on the back foot. Like Mm -hmm. there's always feels like there's something more that I should be doing yes. or something more so a piece that I'm missing or this social platform I'm not on or I missed that course you know it, it just it always feels like just when you think you know what you're doing you don't <laughs> yeah. you know and it's like when is it all gonna click and like make sense and when am I going to have people that will just do this for me <laughs> <laughs> and, and the answer is never <laughs> right because I think even you. as you scale You continue, like, let's say all of a sudden one of your books take off, you're able to hire people to do this piece and that piece and this piece. The reality is you're, you're scaling. You're just getting more stuff to do at that point. So even though you're, you're outsourcing things and you're giving things to other people coming back to you to ask you, what do you want to do about it? I don't know. That's what I hired you for. You figure it out. That's the biggest lesson I've learned this year in particular with the business because City Al grew grew exponentially as I knew it was going to this year is that in publishing in general, the more that you grow and become successful, the more that you will have to do a period. It doesn't matter if you are an independent author, if you're traditionally published, whatever, the more successful you are, the more things you'll have to do. So (laughs) it's never going to end. Right. So, so basically get used to pressure. Yes. Oh, that is what a fantastic. Okay. If you do not like pressure, do not become a writer. I cannot stress this strongly enough. If you are not prepared to be in a pressure cooker all the time, don't become a writer because a big part of writing besides learning how to take criticism and, and developing a thicker skin is really how to handle pressure. So Get going those skills now in whatever way you can is is vitally important. I suggest having a couple of toddlers under <laughs> your feet for a few years. That'll, that'll that's true. If you're it. a parent, you're fine. You can handle it. <laughs> no, mine are teenagers now, so it's a different sort of pressure. But yeah, I it, no, but I I agree because there there is always something things things on you whether it's deadlines, whether it's you know financial stuff you need to deal with. Yeah, it's always coming at you. Yeah. So why do we do this? Well, because we can't. <laughs> we can't do any. Because the reality is, if you're a writer, we can't. You can't. You can do other things. As I said, I've had many different careers and jobs in my life, but it will always come back to writing. At some point, you will still the the muse will call to you, as Marianne would say, right? The muse is coming and she's picking on you. Um, yeah. But the, there's always this sense of like having to tell the story that's inside of you. And I think that's really, if you are wondering if you're a writer or not, that's the biggest way that you can tell. If you have a story that's inside of you that you are burning to get out and it kind of doesn't matter if the world's on fire, right? You still want to get the story out. Right. right. Then girl, you a writer. <laughs> right, right. Can can you not write for months on end and feel mm-hmm. okay? 
Right. If you can. Well, maybe it's not, maybe it, it, writing is a hobby for you, but maybe it's mm -hmm. not your passion and maybe it's not your career. But if you are like lost and like bumbling or drooling or frothing at the mouth because you haven't been able to get your creative juices going, going a little mad, um, <laughs> maybe, maybe a writer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, finding those like writing habits and how to develop your writing can take a long time. So yeah. figuring out like what's the best writing schedule for you and what does it feel like when you're in the zone can be hard to do. But once you get there, you kind of know. Is that something that you felt like you've developed or how you've developed that? Yeah, it definitely took me years before I smartened up and went, hey, wait a minute. I actually am, I get more words done and I feel better about the words that I'm writing when I write say before noon mm -hmm. if I'm writing afternoon I can still get the words out but they're probably not as good or I'm easily distracted or I feel tired yep. I just know that mornings are better for me and so I structure my writing time to be first thing in the morning and mm -hmm. if I have to do something in the afternoon maybe I'm not like editing a final draft of something <laughs> maybe it's still okay to get those first word vomits out at the evening but trying to prioritize when is my brain with it more and for mm -hmm. me that's morning but I know for you total opposite, total opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and you yep. you need you really you really thrive when there is an insane deadline on you like if yes. there is like you need to get 80,000 words in tomorrow boom <laughs> go. <laughs> you're on it right yeah and and honestly that came from oh, came from a lot of things it came from the spending way way too much time in the editing process to the point where I in my first book I had 17 drafts of a book yeah. in my second book I had 13 drafts and that sounds familiar <laughs> it it was so destructive to my process and like I tried to write every day and develop the good habits and and do all of these revisions and it made it so that I published like one book every couple of years. And it was really not, it was not good for my mental health either because it, it meant that I was trying to make it perfect, make it perfect, make it perfect. Right. So I think part of the, the really crunch deadline and writing in large chunks is me forcing myself not to be a perfectionist, forcing myself to write something and, and edit and move on, write something, edit and move on so that I'm not constantly stuck in, stuck in the cycle of being the perfectionist because I have bad tendencies with that. So right. for me, writing every day is not an option. It will just make me go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So it's not a good option for me. So having tight deadlines works for me and works, you know, with the way that I, I process and, and develop writing, but it's definitely not for everyone. It's not yeah. even something that I recommend. It's not something for beginner writers. Like do not try to write 40,000 words in three weeks. Not a good right. idea. Your just figure out what your process up. Everything hurt, starts to hurt. Yeah. You don't sleep well. You don't eat well. It's you not just, great. You just got to figure out like, if you do end up in, in the place where I am, let's say in the place, I know Marianne does this as well, where you are on what she calls hostage deadlines, which I love that word, hostage yep. deadlines, right? Yep. When you're having to write a lot of words very quickly. The best advice I can give is get out of your own way, let the words come. And then if you have to edit as you go, which is what I do, edit as you go one time one pass and then keep moving, keep moving, keep moving one time at it, keep moving. Cause that's the only way you're going to get it done. Yeah. And it does it, like I said, it does work for me, but it's definitely something that I developed from trial and error and learning what didn't work first. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I started out with a gazillion edits at first and oh. then it went from, it, then it, I, then I, I, I trimmed it to like eight and now I'm like at three or four. Yeah. And then for me, three that's or where four is, be where <laughs> leaps that, and bounds better than where it used to be yeah in my opinion that's that's realistic and probably where it should be I think at, at this point I actually don't do full first drafts which again I know is crazy for some people they're like you have to get all the words on the page I'm like no that's not how my brain works um I don't do that so by the time I finished a draft I'm really only going through at the the copy edit kind of phase because my developmental edits are done because I edit as I go 
Um, and that works for me. But if you're going through drafts, I think three to four drafts is very reasonable. I don't think there should be more than that, personally. Yeah, yeah. I, I do do sort of one draft is sort of the word vomit. The second draft is like the major cleanup, get rid of the get rid of the garbage. And then the third draft is, you know, honing the sentences, making sure that you're not using the same word in the same sentence. You're getting rid of those justs or evens. Right. And then the last one is basically letting word read it aloud to me. So I'm finding mm-hmm. those missing words or, you know, the something that sounds wonky. I'm like, oh. That's that's one way to use that word, but it's not the right word. Let's refocus on that. So <laughs> that's sort of my drafting process. But how, do you just do like a, a, a one sort of draft and edit and then just uh, like a, a polish draft? So basically what I do is I call it the six chapters at a time model. So I will write six chapters. No, I try very hard not to look back, but I'll be honest in that in the first Six chapters, I'm usually looking back a little more than I should. And in the latter half, not so much. But I do six chapters at a time. I write them. Then I edit them as if I was polishing the book, as if I was getting rid of all the plot bunnies, making sure everything is smooth. Even before you've written the whole thing, you're... Six. Six Uh chapters. So those first Uh six chapters will be like polished to gold. And then I'll move on but to the you next outline six. heavily. So you know oh, yes. if the plot bunnies necessarily will be there or not, because you know what the story yes. is. Yes, it's very rare that I end up with a plot hole after my outline. I, sh- that I should mention that. Yeah, I do outline very heavily so that I know exactly where it the helps plot with the drafting process. It helps yeah. time management that you can. For sure. Sh- you can spend less time floundering going, wait, did I say that? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I mean, in terms of economics, it you know it's a time saver, making sure you know where you're going. But it's also right. some some people can't work that way, so you got to find think, what works for you. I think that's a pro and a con too. Well, more a pro of writing actually is that the con is that people will tell you there's one way to write. You know, there are certain experts out there that will be like, you must write yep. this way, and that's yep. total nonsense. The True. pro is the reality is there's many different ways to write and get to the the book that you want to put out and it's about finding what works best for you. And I think that's nice in the sense that writing is adaptable. Writing process is adaptable. Even to a certain extent, craft is adaptable because not every story structure is the same. So if you find a story structure that doesn't work for you, you don't necessarily have to write that way. You can find another one, you know, just because the the three act play essentially is the most popular doesn't mean there's not one act plays out there. There are. <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. There are. <laughs> I know I did that on purpose. <laughs> but yeah, so, so that's a good pro so and con. A good segue to that is what would you tell a, a writer who might be struggling with their manuscript, um, mm-hmm. with their value as a writer, who might be struggling mm-hmm. with that imposter syndrome, which is a very big you know, sort of negative part of being writers. We fall yeah. into that imposter stereotype quite often. Even people that have been seasoned in doing this for a while, we still sort of compare ourselves to the success of others. Yeah. What would you tell those writers who are either new or been at it for a while and just feel like they're not getting where they need to be? What What would you say to them? It's funny because I also had this conversation with an, with one of our authors today. Go to your favorite writers, Goodreads or Amazon page, the book that you love, the book that's like the absolute best, the pinnacle for you in your genre specifically, if you can, but if not, it's okay. And read their negative reviews. Read their one star reviews because you're going to see that every single author, even your most beloved author and your most beloved book is going to have negative criticism and negative feedback. That's a reality of the business. Not every book is for every reader and not every book has to be. And I think if you take that in mind, it will automatically ease some of that imposter syndrome pressure. The other thing is everybody feels that way. Even the mega stars, even the ones that you worship the ground that they walk on and you'd fall down if you ever met them in person and you'd be a blabbering mess, right? Even that person feels imposter syndrome. Stephen King, Nora Roberts, the big, you know, the biggest people, James Patterson, the biggest people in the world have still felt imposter syndrome. It's just, it's part of being a creative type. So just remember that you're not alone. The feeling does not last forever. It comes in waves, usually comes and goes. 
Sometimes you're going to feel super great about your writing and it's like, this is the best thing you've ever written. And other times you're going to look at it and want to, you know, throw it into the fire basically. Yeah. But that yeah. those are fleeting feelings and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And, you know, just to, to know you're not alone, I think is really important. What about you, Daniel? Right. Well, I, I, I kind of similar on the, that, that, that end. Um, I was also going to say, say uh, two things. One, look at all of your five star reviews. Yeah. Look at all of those people who really love your work, who need your work to those readers who have reached out to you with tears in their face after they've read something of yours, those moments that lifted you up and sort of reminded you, this is why I do what I do, right? The, the, I, your work has value. Your work has meaning. You're, you're, you know, you have people that want your stuff. So just kind mm -hmm. of reminding yourself like, okay, there's a reason I'm doing this. There are people out there who who want to see my stuff, but also I, along in the, the similar vein is finding your favorite book and maybe rereading it and going, yeah, yeah I want this is why I'm doing this because I want to recreate this feeling in someone else again and just sort of mm -hmm. just like recharging yourself and you know making yourself believe that you have what it takes. It is not yeah. an easy you know it's not a oh I'm gonna write a book and make billions of dollars right it's mm -hmm. not that sort of I mean miracles do happen and things like <laughs> that you know I'm not gonna say never but I think sometimes young authors think all they need to do is hit publish and the money is gonna start rolling in and the simple fact is is that it doesn't yeah <laughs> this is a long game yeah I've been in it 11 years you've been in it how many years now a gazillion? Uh, I don't even know. Yeah. So, I mean, 14, it, maybe? it takes 15. time to figure out how to do this and then how to do it successfully. So, mm -hmm. you know, just remind yourself that you're in this for the long haul and keep, keep, plug it on. You know, one of the things, too, about reading your favorite book, I think it would be, it's really valuable for any writer to learn how to read critically. How to read from an editorial point of view, how to read from, in addition to reading from a fan right. point of view. For example, one of my favorite books of absolutely all times is Lord of the Rings. I love the entire trilogy. I love The Hobbit, but I would be remiss if I if I didn't say, you know, there's there's problems. There's problems in those books. They're wordy sure. as can be. A lot of people are going to find them boring. Um, we yeah. just rewatched an episode of the Goldberg and Goldbergs and uh the boy on it was saying that all they do is walk and talk, walk and talk. And if you've ever read Lord of the Rings, that's they he's walk not, and talk. He's not wrong. They walk <laughs> and talk. Now, does that mean that you know it's still not one of the most beloved books of all times? It a hundred percent is. And there's there's movies and and spinoff shows and all kinds of things and people who will be diehard fans who will tell you all the reasons why you are absolutely wrong. And Lord of the Rings is the greatest of all time. Yeah. But the reality is that if you can read with a critical eye, even something that you love to pieces, you will see that there is no reason for you to feel imposter syndrome because the, even the most beloved thing is not perfect. That perfect is an illusion and striving for it will do nothing but bring you misery. So don't strive for perfect, strive for the best that you can be and put out the best story you can. And there are readers that are going to love it. Yes. Yeah. Wise words, wise words, as always. And that Listen is the best part. Know. That is the best part of being a writer is connecting with readers who are going to love your yeah. book. Absolutely. Absolutely. That <laughs> That is 100%. Like if you ever have a doubt of that, you know, if, if you're a reader and you're like, oh, I wonder if I should reach out to that author and Do tell it. them that I really like their book. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> you don't know. They could be on the verge of quitting writing then and there because they have a feeling that nobody likes their stuff anymore and your words could save them. So, so, send that note. Leave Absolutely. That review, you know, hundred percent, hundred percent. And if you go to see an author at a book signing or an event and you're so scared about walking up to them or saying anything to them, let me tell you, it is the biggest gift to have readers come up to your table and say, you know, I loved your book or I drove here X amount of hours or I flew here or I came from here and I, I worked to get <laughs> Such here. Such a like, good feeling. 
it's such an honor and I don't think there's any bigger praise that you could possibly give an author. So yeah, absolutely reach out, never feel embarrassed about it or shy about it. They're, they're going I'm to always in it. tears when that happens. It's mm -hmm. like, so, so grateful, so much gratitude. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that about does it. We couldn't possibly end on a better note than that. So <laughs> I thank you so much, Danielle. This is this is fun. And make sure everybody out there to tune in next week as we talk more in Bound by Books. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Wait, before you go, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and check us out on our website, boundbybookspodcast.com.